Good to have you here this morning. I'll have to acknowledge this is our first online service uh, that we've done, and you know because of the guidelines in relation to COVID-19 that we are doing this, and we have a few faithful people here helping to set up this particular online uh, service, and this is the way that we're going to be doing this for the next few weeks or until uh, there are changes in relation to how many people can assemble together. So we uh, encourage you to gather your family, your friends together, and either your devices by cell phone, by iPads, or even by TV using Chromecast, you can still use and link to all of these services that will be posted there. So hopefully you'll join us and we'll have a time of singing, a praise of God, hear the word, and then we'll have close out in song. Um, now during this time, one of my favorite songs, I know it's a time that people are very fearful, but believers should not be so. We have a, a sovereign God, our sovereign Father, who is in control of all things, beloved. So for me, in times like this, uh, I find the best comfort, the most comfort you'll find, is in the Word of God. So I pray that you're turning there with your family to the Word of God on a daily basis, uh, teaching them the Scriptures while they're at home with you. It's an awesome time that you can talk to them about the God's Word and God's plan and His control over all things. My favorite psalm, as most of you know already, is Psalm 100. It's the one I learned in Bible camp when I was a young child. The very first psalm, probably, I would say, that I learned. And I'm going to read it here with you, and I hope that you'll join me with your Bibles open to Psalm 100. In Psalm 100, the Word of God says this. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, 
For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. Pray with me, please. Father God, we thank you. We are thankful to you for all that you've given us, Lord. Yes, even the technology you've provided, Lord, for us today, that we are able to worship even in our own homes, together as a family, having family worship time, Lord, but also able to hear your word and your truth. We pray, Lord, that as we go out into the world cautiously, carefully, Lord, following the precautions, that we go out, Lord, not timidly scared, but Lord, we are able to go out with the confidence and the assurance that you are in control of all things. Lord, and we also pray, perhaps the opportunity will be given, that we'll be able to share the gospel, Lord, to share with others to let them know how they too can have this hope that we have. They too can have this peace that surpasses all understanding that comes only from you. We ask now that you would bless us, bless this service, in the precious and holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. We sing through verse 1, 2, and 4. If you have celebration hymnal at home, please turn to hymn number 581. found in Luke chapter 13 verses 1 through 9. As you know we've been preaching through all the Gospels, we've been harmonizing them together uh, in order to get a better understanding of our Lord and Savior as he was on earth and the a message that he taught. And here we find ourselves at uh, Luke 13 1 through 9 and I promise you it is not that I have created a special message for the uh, coronavirus situation that's happening. This was not a special message uh, plan for that. It is exactly where we would have fallen two weeks ago in this process and we are here exactly at these words of Jesus which I fir firmly believe are uh, points right now for everyone to understand. So again if you are at home hopefully watching this and you're able to uh, whether you have your Bible in hand or on phone I'm going to ask that you would stand wherever you are as we reverence the Lord's Word. Luke chapter 13, 1 through 9, and the message is, unless you repent, you too will perish. And the word of God says, Luke 13, 1 through 9, now on the same occasion there were some present reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus said to him, do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed, killed them were worse culprits than all the men who lived in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he began telling this parable. A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. 
And he said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put it in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word and truth, we ask that you would open our hearts and minds to understand. We ask also that you will forgive us of any sins we committed, that we come to your word and truth with a holy and blameless heart. Speak to us now individually, Lord. Your word go into our hearts and minds, Lord, telling us what we ought to do, what we need to do, Lord. Strengthen us, Lord. Admonish us where we need admonishment, Lord. Encourage us where we need encouragement, Lord. Your word does all these things. It is an everlasting word, a true and pure word. It is the truth of God. And Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Beloved, we live in an age now where we are notified within moments about any calamity that comes about, any tragedy that exists on this planet. There are news agencies that will tell you within minutes or hours, uh, less than hours it seems today, about anything that's happening. We have the 24-hour news cycle. And there's always some breaking news about earthquakes somewhere in the south, or tsunamis in the Indian Ocean, you have volcanic eruptions here and there, tornadoes flying around here and there, hurricanes the, on the eastern coast, the Gulf, the United States. It's just every time that we turn on the news, you can find out about anything that's going on just about anywhere these days, whether it's in the news on, on television or whether it's on your cell phones or through Twitter accounts or through Facebook accounts, you find out about calamities that are happening everywhere. Every year we're told about wildfires in California or, or even the fires in Australia uh, that are going, typhoons in Asia, avalanches in Europe, and epidemics that occur in third world country, not to mention even the man-made disasters such as wars, terrorism, genocide, crimes, riots, and accidents. And today we have now the pandemic of the coronavirus and it's causing people everywhere to experience vicariously all the pain, all the suffering, and the death that those catastrophes bring. And with those situations, there is always the thought process that has bled into uh, these situations, a sort of pseudo-religious supposition that only really bad things happen to bad people. In some religions, a really bad thing is a result of the previous lives where the person had done wrong and they are praying and they're paying for it in this life. Even in Judaism, we noticed uh, that this thought prevailed with the disciples, looked upon a man born blind and they asked Jesus if the blindness of this young man was the result of some sin his parents committed uh, or was it the result of a sin that this child could have committed in the womb. The Jewish people of Jesus' day believed that the explanation of why bad things happened was pretty simple. Uh, it was to singular people, it was this. Calamities were always God's judgment on sin. But the theology was wrong. Calamities are not God's ways of singling out especially wicked people for punishment. As if those people who die in the calamity are worse than those who survive. The truth is that all people are guilty sinners deserving of death. And everyone, everyone, is living on borrowed time. God withholds judgment for a time because he is patient and he is merciful, but that patience will eventually end and it runs out. And whether a person lives a good life or a bad life makes no difference if they have not repented. Verse one says this. Now on the same occasion, there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans who blood, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Luke's statement here uh, that this happened on the same occasion connects us all with the events from before in the discourse in chapter 12 in which Jesus mentioned God's judgment. Apparently that must have kicked off a discussion about God's judgment and it looked into the story of the Galileans who people had questions about who had come to offer sacrifices. Uh, through some event it appears that Pilate had ordered troops to kill the Galileans who were offering sacrifices. More likely it was during the Passover and their blood mingled with the blood of the animals being offered to God as a sacrifice. And for such an event to have occurred at that time would have been a horrifying to most Jews and in a sense something so spectacular and so extraordinary that the people wondered if there was some secret sin that these Galilean pilgrims who seemed to be righteous coming up to offer sacrifices, maybe there was some secret sin that they harbored for, in order for them to go through such a painful and extraordinary death. Now how does God's judgment fit in here? Was this God's judgment on them? 
Now we can say this question also looms today in, in our minds too. We hear about people who have perished in some horrible catastrophe uh, where one person is killed in, in a storm and the person next to him is survives. And people wonder where God is in this, especially when it seems like the person who was a good person morally, and that is what happened here, pilgrims who came to offer sacrifice to God, and they're indiscriminately killed by some really tragic situation. In this case, the Galileans were killed by Pilate, one of the enemies of Israel. Since Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, anything he would say about Pilate was sure to get there before him. But if he ignores the issue, the crowd is going to accuse him of being pro-Roman and disloyal to his people. If he defended the Jews and accused Pilate, he would be in trouble with the Romans, and the Jewish leaders would have a good excuse to get him arrested. Jesus' response at first seems to be kind of callous and maybe a little dismissive of it. But he moves the whole issue to a higher level, really, beyond the right, rightness or wrongness of Pilate or the event and the actions, and he avoids the whole political question completely. He addresses the issue at the greater importance and links it with truth to the mission of Jesus Christ. In verse 2 he said this, And Jesus said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you, no. Stop there. As Jesus usually does, he answers a question with a question. His first in his statement, Jesus makes it clear, they all are sinners, both the Galileans there and everyone else were sinners. And says, do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners? To say that they were greater is to presume, uh, presume that others were lesser sinners, but sinners are just the same. It is true that God sometimes immediately judges sinners for a specific sin. That does happen, as he did with Herod in Acts 12, 21 through 23. But there's also built-in judgments, beloved, for sinful behavior. For example, as alcohol abuse leads to cirrhosis of the liver, immorality leading to sexually transmitted diseases, or criminal behavior leading to a violent death. There are built-in judgments based on acti sinful actions that happen already. These judgments were not in view here, though. Jesus is not referring to the inevitable consequences of sin, but rather to the catastrophic calamities that fall on people seemingly without discrimination. But here in this catastrophe, Jesus asked them if they thought God allowed this to happen to them, those Galileans, because they were really great sinners. And so they suffered this fate. And Jesus' answer to them is no. That is not the reason they died. Now we'll come back to verse 3, but I want to drop to verse 4. He says, or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed were worse culprits than all men who lived in Jerusalem? Now you have a different group of people here who die, and it doesn't appear that they were doing anything at all. They were just happened to be in the area. They were there on the day, and the tower in Siloam falls on them. It kills them. Jesus asks, using their same theological approach, if they thought the, those 18 people who have died in a spectacular situation were they worse culprits than, than uh, are simply the worst kind of people than all other men who live in Jerusalem? Now, verse 3 and verse 5 below point to the real issue, the real tragedy here. But first, remember, last week Jesus gave us the parable of verse 58, where he talked about going to the magistrate with your adversary and that you would take, uh, you would take your time to work things out before you reach the magistrate where it would be too late. In verse 3, Jesus says, I tell you no. It's the same as in verse 5. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, what do you mean by repent, you might ask? What do I mean by that? To repent means this, that you change your mind about your sinfulness. Change your mind about your sinfulness. You stop thinking of yourself as a pretty good person, that you're generally okay, and you see yourself the way God sees your sin. You see yourself as a sinner. And once you see that, it changes your thought process about sin once you understand it completely. When that happens, you actually start to mourn your sin. And you see you that you are a sinner and you deserve the holy wrath of God against sin. And that you are, beloved, headed for hell. You've broken God's law and are deserving of the penalty. And also you accept the personal guilt and the expectation of the judgment of God as a just judgment on you as a guilty sinner. You deserve punishment. There is no more in your mind excuses. You don't say, well, it's because of my children or because of my boss or because of my spouse. That's the real reason why I am the way that I am. You accept the truth that you are a sinner and you are guilty of your sins before a holy God and you deserve punishment. 
No longer are you saying that it's someone else's fault. You're accepting your own, your own role in this. It's a center of being that not only his conduct, but his heart is evil and a rebellious and contrary to God, God and his law. Simply put, you agree with God's diagnosis of your wretchedness and understanding that you can do absolutely nothing about it. So you come to the one person, the only person, who can do something about your sin. That person is only and will always be only Jesus. You need his mercy. You need his grace. You need his forgiveness. You need his deliverance. And there is only one Savior, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. The person in repentance acknowledges Jesus Christ as their only Savior, accepts him and believes that he is their only Lord. Repentance in the New Testament always included, always included in the New Testament, faith in Jesus Christ as the only Savior. You could talk about repentance in its narrow sense, the sense that it's really turning away from sin, but, and that, it would, that would be a good way to be used, but in the New Testament gospel usage, it's, always, it's talking about always embracing faith in Christ. It is turning 180 degrees, so that is turning from sin to something, and the something or someone is always Christ. Now, just like the parable about the magistrate, to avoid judgment, you must be reconciled to God before you have to face him, because then it will be too late. Verse 6 begins the parable that Jesus uses to talk about this, and says, and he began telling this parable, which links into the verses before. A man had a fig tree, had been planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it, didn't find it. And he said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years, can you imagine that? Three years he's been coming to this tree looking for fruit on this fig tree and not finding any. So normally, what would anyone do after three years of not finding fruit? He says, cut it down. Why does he even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, this is the vineyard keeper, said, let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine, but if not, cut it down. This is a simple agrarian parable about fig trees. And fig trees were common in all of Israel. Fig trees uh, and figs are mentioned in about more than 50 times in Scripture itself. Under good conditions, favorable conditions, fig trees can reach to a height of 25 feet. In addition to providing fruit, fig trees were an excellent source of shade. Since the fig tree was planted in the vineyard, it was not a wild one. It would have been put to the right spot for growth and watered appropriately normally. And according to Leviticus 9, 23 and 25, fruit from a newly planted tree was not eaten for the first three years. And the fourth year, the crops belonged to the Lord. A farmer would not get any figs for himself, really, until the fifth year. But this man had now been waiting for seven years, really. No wonder he wanted to cut down the fruitless tree. But the vineyard keeper pleaded to let the fig tree stay and that he would put fertilizer around it, and he would cultivate it, and then it would bear, and then if it bears fruit, he will let it alone, but if it does not bear fruit, then it will be cut down. The first if there is a conditional clause, if it bears fruit. It's a third class condition, uh, which expresses something that is unlikely to happen. The next conditional clause, if not cut it down, is a first class condition, which expresses something likely to happen. The parable gives the, illustrates a, the reality here that the parable and the fig tree is Israel, and that Israel will continue to fail to bear spiritual fruit even after the arrival of Jesus as Messiah and would finally be destroyed. Like the tree in the parable, Israel was living on borrowed time and demonstrated little reason to hope for anything different in the future. But God is gracious and long-suffering towards people. And 2 Peter 4 and 9 reminds us that and does and he does more than enough to encourage us to repent and bear fruit. But there's a warning here. Any tree or branch also, in Matthew 3, 7-10, any tree or branch that does not bear fruit, he has every right to cut us down. But in his mercy he has spared us, yet we must not presume upon the kindness and long-suffering of the Lord, for the day of judgment will finally come. But also the tree reminds us of God's special goodness to Israel and his patience with them. God waited three years during our Lord's earthly ministry, but the nation did not produce fruit. In fact, in the last year of Jesus' ministry, they hardened their hearts against, against him, calling for the death of the Messiah. And even after the death of his son, God then waited about 40 years before he allowed the Roman armies to destroy Jerusalem and the temple. And during those years, the church gave to the nation a powerful witness of the gospel message. 
but finally the tree was cut down. What's significant here is also this, beloved. The parable is open-ended so that the listeners would have to supply the conclusion themselves. Because the question is, did the tree bear fruit? Did the special care that was the fertilizing and that was done to it, did that accomplish anything at all? Was the tree spared or cut down? And you have no way to know the answer to these questions. But let me just turn this inward to our own lives. Let's answer the question there. Again, the question is not what happens to the tree, but what happens to me? In this time of fear and anxiety, beloved, many people are turning to self-medication. That is, uh, we've heard of that the stores are stayed open so that they can continue to sell alcohol. They're now allowed to deliver alcohol uh, in, in, um, remotely and start uh, driving to places and delivering alcohol. People have turned to alcohol, they've turned to drugs, uh, and they've turned to Netflix for relief. But really, you can only watch so many shows. You can only drink so much, and then what do you do? It is here that believers should demonstrate the peace of God and the thankfulness to God and point people to God's word. As Paul reminded the Philippians in Philippians 4, 6 through 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. In all of this, beloved, we are not afraid. Believers are not afraid at all because we are reminded that our Father is in control of all things and there is nothing that is not known to him. Yes, even the coronavirus has its known to him and is controlled by him. We are promised that after having been thankful, giving our request to God, he provides us with peace that is not understandable to the world. It, the world can understand why we are at peace, are at peace during this time. The world can't understand that. Why we're not running around fearful. Why we're not running around hoarding bags of, of, of uh, hand sanitizer and bags of, uh, of toilet paper. We're not doing that. We're not those people running around in fear. Or in some cases, as we've seen, uh, the other places that are full also are the gun shops now. That people are going to those things, thinking that all society is about to collapse. Our God is in control. We don't walk around in fear. And during this time, he provides us with peace that is not understandable to the world and a peace that guards our hearts and minds. That is, it guards our emotions, our thoughts, and our actions in Christ. And that goes in line with the commandment of Jesus to not be worried about our lives, about what we should eat or what we should drink or what we should wear. I add, we should also not be worried about how many rolls of toilet paper that we have. God will care for us as he always has. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Though we do not live in fear, we are mindful to be obedient to our governing bodies and taking recommended precautions, and then at the same time seek an opportunity to proclaim the gospel and give an answer for the hope that lies within us. But I also would tell you there is a sense of urgency too. God's patience with those living on borrowed time is not permanent. Therefore, the Bible exhorts sinners to seek the Lord where he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. And the only way to draw near to God is to come with a heart of repentance. Turn from our sins. Ask for forgiveness. God is seeking fruit. He will accept no substitutes. And the time to repent is now. As we move through these days and weeks of this virus that's going through and going around, ask yourself, am I just taking up space or am I bearing fruit to God's glory? We want to keep those things in mind because this is the time when believers need to demonstrate their love for Christ and their love for their neighbor also in sharing the gospel. We love our neighbors as we love ourselves. But we need to be sober too, beloved. One of the things that has bothered me honestly about this pandemic is that there is no one saying uh, that these events could be perhaps a judgment from God against the sins of the nations. There's no one saying that. Many will say that God doesn't do that any longer, that he doesn't uh, bring down judgments. Uh, since, he's, uh, since the death of Christ, he's, he's merciful, more merciful than he was before. But God does not change. God was merciful before Christ came on earth. God was loving before Jesus Christ went to the cross. 
and before the gospel is even preached. God does not change who he is. And if he is a loving God, you also must remember he is a righteous God. And he must judge by nature sin. And if we as a nation have committed and sanctioned sin events in our churches and, and, and in the world, do we not also deserve God's righteous judgment? That being true, what do you think will happen if we as a nation do not repent? All across this country, there are a few churches that I've seen saying that we as a nation have sinned against the holy God and that we need to repent. Very few are saying that. And I think that's the message that Christ is saying here, is that you repent or else you will likewise perish. It's a timely message of truth. Listen, the governments, the world governments, are looking about how to restore the incomes and the economies of the nation. They're looking to uh, how to give people money back and jobs and, and businesses, both to, how to give money both to businesses, both small and large. But let me ask you a question here. At this, as various economic packages are floated around and passed in various countries here and others. What about the churches? What about the churches? Many of the churches that are around today are roughly one or two months away from being solvent without consistent giving. Many of the churches will not finish out this year and they will not be able to even finish out this year because of the mortgage that they have uh, and the debt that they owe and the loans that they have taken out because the giving that has been lost without people attending. And it's interesting how when you look at the timing of this virus, the event, that it has impacted specifically around the Lenten season. And it's moving directly towards Easter. Easter is the time when most churches will experience their largest amount of revenue because almost everybody, at least as a ceremonially or traditionally, will find their way to a church on Easter. It's where we typically wear our new hats and new clothes and uh, things for Easter and so forth. But this virus has prevented people so far from even really observing Lent very to the extent, or even going to the services they would have normally gone through during this time period. Churches are already calling to the, govern, uh, to the governing authorities and saying that they cannot survive this length of time of separation and they will not be able to make it for the months afterwards. Like I said, many churches live in the margins of giving. So if this is a judgment, and I can't say 100% that it is, but when I look at the scope and the scale of it, when I see that it actually impacts not just one small area, but it is global in its impact, and it has shuttered us up in small areas to one another, it has made people very fearful. I look at this, and I wonder in some aspects if the judgment first isn't one that falls against the churches. Perhaps this is God purifying and refining the church. Because if what happens here, many of them fall away, there will be less people to, less churches out there. And maybe it's a judgment against the church because it has failed to do its mission. Because the church has failed to tell sinners that they need to repent. It has failed to teach the word of God that people would live holy. It has failed to truly make disciples. I don't know for certain. It's not as though God has spoke to me and said, this is it. But I'm looking at the things and being wise and what's happening. And what I don't see, people are calling for, maybe this will generate a revival. But I've said this before and I'll say it again. Before you can have a revival, you must have people calling for repentance. And if our churches aren't calling for repentance, then how will you have revival? Nevertheless, the words of Jesus, timeless, are still true today. Unless you repent, you will likewise perish. We need to go out with the gospel that repentance is necessary to be saved. I invite you to pray with me. Father God, we...
come to a point where we have to examine ourselves. Have we been simply playing church all this time? Are we playing with it? Playing with God's word? Not living according to his word and his truth? Maybe examining if we really truly are saved. Because it's more about getting dunked in or dipped in some water. It's more about getting a card to a membership to a church. There's nothing magic in the water. There's nothing magic with the card. It is about faith in Christ. Christ alone who can save you. We're only on this earth for a short time, Lord. Time, if you are truly a believer, to go and share the word of God. To tell people they need to repent. We need to repent. As a nation, we are guilty of so many sins and we have sanctioned sin to the point that even in our churches, we just let it go and won't talk about it. But without repentance, there can't be salvation. So beloved, we pray together that we will go forth proclaiming the gospel that sinners can be saved through faith in Christ Jesus but you need to repent and unless you repent you will likewise perish I pray that you would do so with your family, with your friends, those you can talk to and you will find that as God is moving in the hearts and minds of people you will find that those who know that what you truly believe and know what you stand for, they're going to start asking you some questions. They're going to ask you some questions about what's going on, what do you think is happening. And that is the time in which you can give them the gospel and share with them the truth and the hope that we have and how they can be saved. I pray that you would do so. In Jesus' name. Our closing hymn is going to be hymn number 235, Take the Name of Jesus with You. We're going to sing verses 1 and 2. with them and keep encouraged during this time because as we said before God is in control of all things uh, also keep your church family in prayer um, because as we can talk to them communicate with them and I pray that you're doing so that you're reaching out to 
also your neighbors as well as your church family, uh, calling them, checking on them, seeing how they're doing. The deacons are calling their, uh, their family members and letting them, checking on them also to see how they're doing. But if there's any need that you have, please let us know. Uh, you can contact me easily. Uh, everyone has my uh, email address, so please contact, or contact the church and let us know if there's a need that you have so we can see how we can uh, meet those needs that you may have. Uh, please, by any means, if there's something that you do need, do not hesitate, do not wait. Let us know so we can act upon those needs as quickly as possible uh, in the body of Christ. I pray that the Lord will continue to bless you. Uh, as I said, be encouraged. Do not at all live in sadness or in fear. Uh, God is in control of all things. We don't live that way, and we have the hope of Jesus wherever we go uh, so that we should never sit around and be afraid or fearful. So take that time, look to the Word of God, uh, continue to dig deep in God's Word, and you will find the comfort and peace that He has promised in there. So I pray the Lord will continue to bless you, and we will see you again next week. Uh, same time as the service we posted up there, and we hope that you will join us again. The Lord bless you.